What is going on, Grace Online family? We're so glad you joined us this weekend. Dr. Hugh Ross is joining us virtually, so we're super excited. But before we get started with the service, make sure you leave a like on either Facebook or YouTube. Also, share this broadcast with somebody, and then make sure you comment. We have an awesome social media team that wants to engage with you guys. All right, let's dive into worship. God bless you guys. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to our conference weekend with Hugh Ross. Welcome to those joining us online as well. Let's just all stand together. Let's take a minute to stretch. <laughs> We're gonna start off worshiping the Lord, singing this old song together. It goes like this. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens, your name be praised. From the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, this song we
over all creation. the 
Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your kindness. Oh, we love you, Lord. Good morning. It's good to see you. Thank you, worship team. If you will, go ahead and have a seat. Give somebody an air high five, fist bump through the air, grab your bulletins. I want to highlight a few things this morning before we get started. Thank you for those joining online as well and tracking with us. If this happens to be the, the first time you're here with us and checking out Grace Church, I want to encourage you to interact with us and get some more information and let us pray for you. There's a connect card right here in your seats and, and up in the pews and online as well. You can see how to do that. It's a real easy way to gather some new information, ask questions. But what we really want to encourage you to do is, is put a prayer request on there. We're, we're, we're really committed to, to praying for you and asking the Lord to stretch out His hand and to, to, to really provide in whatever area of need that you may have. Now, here's one way we can do this. We're making a lot of phone calls these days and praying and encouraging for people. So if you're not comfortable with putting your phone number on there, then I want to encourage you to, if you have a prayer request and you want to receive prayer, call the church office. You can leave your number with our secretary. We'll get it out. One of our pastors or leaders will call and, and pray for you. But we really want to encourage you to, to take us up on that. Typically, we take our offering at, at this time of the service, but we're doing that all at the end now. You'll see on your way out, there's different places across the campus as you leave at all the exits. There's receptacles that you can put your tithes and offerings in. Of course, those of you that are doing that online, you can continue to do that as well. Uh, real quick, let's pull out your bulletins. I want to highlight a, a few things that are really, really lots of good stuff. What's encouraging is that we're beginning to see some opportunities for our kids and students to get back on campus with us. Can somebody say amen to that? That's a good sign. But this back to school, August 16th, check this out in your bulletin. Back to school, this is next Sunday at the 11 a.m. We're going to have something unique. In the gym, we're going to have a big family service for us to take our kids to as parents. And, you know, kids ages go together with their parents, be uh, involved in that in a very unique attempt to have a, a family church service. I think it's going to be really cool. I know Amanda and I are excited about it. You can see the details there. Our Grace students are beginning to be back on campus again this month. Lots of student ministry on Wednesday night happening. At the 11 a.m., we always have small groups now for our students. See the details on that one. And then I want to highlight any dads that have uh, sons, 12 and older, right here at the Sunrise Legacy Weekend. My boy, my oldest boy is 12 now. I'll be doing this. We're having an information meeting tomorrow. You can see the details. This is a weekend. It's going to be toward the end of the month that we're going to take our boys together and really have a time to bond with our sons and to challenge some, just some godly virtue to grow in that relationship between father and son. So you want to you check that out. One of our pastors, Bob Pickett, has been leading this for years with some great men here at the church. Uh, it's something that you won't regret. Okay, so a little, little unique this weekend. We're having a conference weekend, as, as Caleb said earlier. And what that means is that all three of our, our services th this weekend are unique. We had a, a special service last night that's different content than what we're going to hear this morning. And then we're going to have more different content at the 11 a.m., we're having Dr. Hugh Ross join us virtually from his, uh, play, uh, his office there in Los Angeles. He is an astrophysicist slash theologian slash pastor. Incredible mind that will inspire us to really have faith that science and the Bible does not contradict each other. This is what I love about Dr. Ross's teaching. So here's what we're going to do. During the teaching... This morning, he's going to teach for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to have a, a 30 minutes after to interact with him live and to have questions. So if you have questions as he's teaching, text this number that you see. We'll keep it up throughout the service. Text in a question. I'll be fielding those. We'll get through as many as possible. And then, of course, Dr. Ross will, 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 will explain, if you, we didn't get to your question, how we, you can still interact with him and his team and get your questions answered. But it's going to be a fantastic time. Uh, so let's uh, be just attentive to that and go ahead and text in your questions. Okay, we're going to pray, jump right in. Dr. Ross is going to be joining us. And then we're going to come back out and interact with him with some Q&A. Father, we, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Grace Church. We thank you for your provision in our life. The way that even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, you have continually met our needs. We don't overlook that. We say thank you for that. And we ask you for help for those that are in need. 
Lord, use our tithes and offerings to, to, to continue to make an impact here in our city, to meet needs and to cause the gospel of Jesus to go forth. And Lord, we thank you for Dr. Hugh Ross and all that he's brought to here to our church and to the body of Christ across the globe. Strengthen him in his ministry. In the name of Jesus, amen. Can we give a big Grace Church St. Louis welcome to Dr. Hugh Ross as he joins us this morning? Well, thank you for inviting me to share with you uh, through this amazing 21st century technology we call Zoom. It's not the same as being with you there in person. I look forward to that being possible once we get past this pandemic. Uh, but thank you for inviting me to share with you uh, through this uh, channel. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, you know, show uh, my uh, slides through uh, screen share so you'll be able to see that. Uh, but when we're done, uh, I'm going to take questions. We're going to take questions uh, from you and uh, anything you want to talk about. Uh, but let me uh, begin by uh, taking the share screen feature here. OK, all of you should see, be seeing my first slide here. And uh, it's just a reminder, if you don't get to ask your question today, I do take questions on both my Facebook and Twitter page. All of our scholars had reasons to believe do that, so please take advantage of that. And yes, we do have a 24 7 YouTube channel, and you can subscribe for free. Details are at reasons.org. And uh, a couple of books I've written on this subject, I briefly hinted on this subject of uh, weathering climate change in my book, Improbable Planet. You can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. Uh, but my latest book, as where I devoted an entire book, a thick book, as you can see, to the subject of weathering climate change. Uh, please note the subtitle, A Fresh Approach. This is a book on weathering climate change that you're not going to see in any other text. And again, you can get a free chapter at reasons.org uh, slash Ross. And the main theme of what you see in weathering climate change is, number one, it's real. It's not a hoax. I give the latest evidence for why it is real. Uh, but most of the book is really focused on how we can continue to stabilize this amazing climate stability that God has given us. And it really is a miracle that we've had such outstanding climate stability. How we can do that while well, we boost the world economy rather than cripple the world economy, and especially for the benefit of the poorest people on the earth. We're not stuck between a rock and a hard place where we need to choose what's best for the environment and what's best for human beings. There are solutions God has provided uh, that are good for both. But I wanna begin by explaining to you, uh, number one, that climate change is the norm for planet Earth. Climate stability is the extreme exception. And how it was that we ended up with this 10,000 year period of extreme climate stability. And it all begins uh, about two and a half million years ago where a giant asteroid uh, struck. Uh, but I want to set the context here uh, by looking first at what happens to the physics of the sun. I spoke of this about this earlier. Uh, when we look at the sun, it gets brighter and brighter as it gets older and older. Uh, that's simply the result of the hydrogen bomb that's blowing up in the core of the sun on a continuous basis. Uh, which is converting hydrogen to helium. That conversion uh, causes the sun uh, to burn progressively more efficiently uh, over its history. But I want you to notice uh, that right now, uh, the sun is brighter than it's ever been in the history of life on planet Earth. And for 90% of that history, our planet had no ice. So this is a paradox. We got ice on the planet now, quite a lot of it, how come we got so much ice on planet Earth when the sun is at its brightest that it's ever been in the history of life? Well, it begins 2.5 million years ago, 2.58 million years ago, when a giant asteroid uh, struck in the South Pacific Ocean. It struck just off the south tip of South America at a location where the ocean depth was 17,000 feet. And because of that, the crater only recently has been recognized. In fact, if you go to the very bottom, you really don't see a crater, but we see all kinds of isotope evidence scattered over a region that measures 500 kilometers by 300 kilometers 
that tells us that an object probably as large as four kilometers across, at least one kilometer across, but it might have been a four kilometer across asteroid uh, that struck the water there. And when it struck, it caused a massive tidal wave to ripple through the world's oceans. And by a big tidal wave, I've been talking a tidal wave a thousand feet high uh, and running at hundreds of miles an hour uh, throughout the oceans, we actually see damage, uh, you know, basically flood deposits lined up on the shores, not only around the Pacific Ocean, but even around the Atlantic. In fact, in the Adriatic Sea around Italy, we see evidence of a thousand foot tidal wave uh, being washed up there and creating a huge uh, mud deposit. And it dates back uh, to the moment uh, when this asteroid struck. Uh, but also the splash uh, caused all kinds of aerosols to go up in the atmosphere. The asteroid struck all the way down the bottom of the ocean floor and caused all the uh, chemicals at the bottom of the floor, they're especially sulfur compounds, uh, to be blown up into the atmosphere. And so we had all these diverse chemical aerosols. And what it did is it created uh, a cloud cover that blocked out the light of the sun for several years. What we would call the equivalent of a nuclear winter existed because of this asteroid collision uh, for many years, uh, blocking out the light of the sun. And this is what really accelerated the growth of ice over Antarctica. Ice reflects sunlight with 50 to 60% efficiency. So that began to cool down the planet and allow ice to form at other locations like Greenland and in the Tibetan Plateau, uh, the Arctic Ocean as well. Without this asteroid striking, we wouldn't have ice on planet Earth today. There are other factors that are in play that describe why we wind up with so much ice. I cover those in my book, Weathering Climate Change, but this is the event that got it all started. However, we now see that there was a second asteroid uh, that struck, three big asteroids struck. Here's number two. It struck in the South uh, China Sea and uh, basically obliterated uh, the Spratly Islands. There's a big island there, uh, but this, uh, by the way, that little red dot there shows the minimum size of the crater. Uh, that blue circle shows the maximum size of the crater. And if you look over to the left uh, in the nation of Laos, you see a little ellipsoidal blue circle uh, that shows you uh, that this was an asteroid or more likely a giant comet that came through the atmosphere. And comets have the property that when they penetrate our atmosphere, they split up. So we now have evidence that there's at least two crater sites in this uh, region of the South China Sea. And it is such that it played a contributing factor in changing our ice age cycle, which was ignited by that collision in the uh, South Pacific Ocean from a 41,000 year period into an approximately 100,000 year period. The 41,000 period we know is driven uh, by the changing tilt of Earth's rotation axis. It tilts back and forth between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees. When it tilts over to 24.5, the planet gets warmer. 22.1, it gets cooler and has a 41,000 year periodicity. And so with that asteroid striking in the uh, South Pacific Ocean, it ignited uh, this ice age cycle of a 41,000 year period where a planet oscillated between 10% ice coverage and about 20% ice coverage. But beginning 800,000 years ago, that cycle changed and this collision in, this, in, this, in the South China Sea was one of multiple factors, over a dozen factors that happened to all take place coincidentally at the same time that changed the cycle over to 100,000. This was crucial because with a 41,000 year periodicity, the warm interglacials, where you got 10% ice coverage, would only last a couple of thousand years. Not enough time to launch global human civilization. But this transition to a 100,000 year cycle made it possible uh, to have warm interglacials that last 10,000 years. And what's interesting is the warm interglacial wind right now is the longest lasting of all. It's now around 13,000 years that we've been in this warm uh, interglacial. And this next slide 
actually shows you uh, the details of what happens to the global mean temperature uh, during this uh, ice age uh, cycle. So it shows the last four uh, ice ages. And basically what it reveals is that you have about a 90,000 year period where ice covers more than 20% of the planet. And uh, then as uh, a number of factors come into sync, uh, the planet rapidly warms and it warms uh, up until it reaches a temperature about two to three degrees centigrade above where the global mean temperature is right now. And when it hits that peak, it rapidly drops back down uh, into uh, an ice age. And so this shows you that the uh, interglacials where you got the temperatures as warm as it is today or warmer, really don't last very long at all. We're talking centuries, uh, not thousands of years. And what I wanna show you, incidentally, this is just kind of a rough uh, temperature graph of the last 400,000 years. Uh, what I wanna show you is a more detailed uh, temperature uh, that we get from these deep ice cores in the Alps, in Greenland, uh, in the uh, Tibetan Plateau, as also in Antarctica. Uh, basically showing you that when you're in an ice age where you got 20 to 23% coverage, the global mean temperature is jumping up and down uh, by more than 18 degrees uh, Fahrenheit on time scales of just centuries. This explains why humans that were living during the last ice age were not able to launch and sustain global civilization. The global mean temperature was so extremely unstable that it was not possible uh, for them to specialize on certain crops. They would have to plant multiple crops on little small farms, recognizing that most of the crops would fail, not knowing which crops would succeed and feed their families on the ones that would. Same thing with their animal husbandry. They couldn't specialize and scale up. They had to have small communities of different kinds of farm animals, again, not knowing uh, which would thrive and which would not. Uh, we have evidence that humans living during this time were engaged in relatively sophisticated technology where they were planting fields, uh, cultivating grains, uh, grinding those grains, roasting those grains and turning them to bakery products. But everything was on such a tiny scale, not until recently has this evidence been uncovered. And what you see here is typical of the past 2.6 million years, extreme climate instability. The enigma has been what's happened in the past 9,500 years. And so this next slide actually shows you uh, what has happened, where we go from the extreme climate instability, you see from 10,000 years ago uh, back to 17,000 years ago. But following that, we have this 10,000 year period of extreme climate stability. Now, what you've probably read or heard uh, is that the last 9,500 years, the global mean temperature has been stable to plus or minus two degrees centigrade. The latest temperature measurements tell us it's been stable to plus or minus 0.65 uh, degrees uh, centigrade. And that explains why uh, humans starting about 10,000 years ago, were able to build cities and villages and transportation systems, begin to specialize uh, in their various economic endeavors and trade with one another. And that's what we call the Neolithic revolution when civilization was launched. And because of the extreme climate stability that was sustained over this period, uh, that revolution continued uh, where we now have billions of people in the face of the earth being efficiently fed by just 1% of the human population, which means the other 99% of us get to do things like engineering and science and medicine, art and the music, and explains why we have such a rich civilization today, why we have all this technology, why we have all this wealth, um, and also explains in the context of the Christian faith, how it is that billions of people can hear the gospel message understand the gospel message and respond to that message in a relatively short period of time. The big mystery uh, for the climate has been what caused this change from extreme climate instability to this period of extreme climate stability. 
And uh, we didn't know the answer until literally about 18 months ago. And I managed to get it into my book, uh, Weathering Climate Change. You see a little dotted line there. That's called the Younger Driest Cooling Event. Lasted 1,200 years. Uh, began about uh, you know 12,800 years ago and uh, continued until about 11,600 years ago. And what this did, it was, here it was the temperature was rising up to its normal maximal peak that you see in the ice age cycle, but it was rising up to its natural peak. Something happened that caused the global mean temperature to drop uh, by about 12 degrees uh, centigrade. And uh, this uh, global cooling event stopped the temperature from going up to its normal maximum of about two to three degrees centigrade above where we are now. <coughs> and that played a huge role in bringing about this period of extreme climate uh, stability. But what was the cause of this 1200 year cooling event? What, what happened uh, that stopped the temperature from rising up and brought about this cooling, preventing the temperature from going up to its normal peak? Uh, where it would melt the polar ice cap. And when you melt the polar ice cap, you have a lot more water vapor coming off the Arctic Ocean that falls as snow on Siberia and Canada. That's what causes the ice age to happen so quickly uh, after that kind of uh, extreme warming event. Well, we now know that the cause of this younger driest cooling event was an asteroid that struck in Northwest Greenland. And it was discovered almost by accident what happened was a NASA aircraft that was equipped with deep ice penetrating radar happened to have the radar on as was flying over Northwest Greenland. And they found this anomaly under 3000 feet of ice. That anomaly uh, was a crater that measured more than 30 kilometers across uh, just at the edge of the Hiawatha ice field. And so they saw this crater, actually able to map it with the radar, and they sent teams of geophysicists to the edge of the Hiawatha uh, ice field, and they saw meltwater coming off from underneath that had the signature of a giant metal asteroid that struck in that part of Northwest uh, Greenland. And uh, that had the impact of making a major climatic shift in North, North America and the North Atlantic because this asteroid struck Northwest Greenland at the same time we had this huge glacial lake uh, in central North America uh, covering much of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, virtually all of uh, Minnesota and many other uh, US states. So there's this huge glacial lake and it was being fed by melting glaciers uh, that were still receding uh, all over Canada. <clears throat> and it drained out into the Gulf of Mexico. But when that giant asteroid uh, struck in Northwest Greenland, it caused huge rocks uh, to fall all over the northern part of North America. And uh, that fall of rocks blocked the flow of water uh, into the Mississippi and down into the Gulf of Mexico and opened up two more drainage channels. This is basically what happened. Uh, the pelting of rocks uh, blocked the flow of water to the Gulf of Mexico, but opened up two channels. One that flowed through the Great Lakes and through the St. Lawrence River and out into the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the other one that was opened up uh, was through Great Slave and Great Bear Lakes and out under the Beaufort Sea uh, in the Yukon area. And at that time, there was a powerful ocean current that would take this cold water coming out into the Beaufort Sea and drive it past Baffin Island, between Baffin Island and Greenland and out of the North Atlantic, where it basically joined that cold melt water that was flowing out through the St. Lawrence. And what it did is it turned back the Gulf Stream the Gulf Stream, as many of you are aware, is primarily responsible for keeping Europe as warm as it is. Uh, but this cold glacial meltwater turned back that Gulf Stream, which drove, drove a cooling event that impacted all of Europe, uh, Western Siberia. It had a major impact uh, on uh, Greenland 
and uh, Canada and uh, parts of the northern US. And this is the 1200 year Younger Dryas uh, cooling event that prevented the global mean temperature going up to its maximum and actually played the key role in giving us this period of extreme climate stability. But if you look in detail on that little blue wiggly line, flat line that you see starting about 10,000 years ago and going through the present, what you actually notice is that you have a very gradual decline in global mean temperature. It took 9,500 years for the global mean temperature to decline by one degree. And we now know is that throughout this period, we've got the tilt of our rotation axis uh, going uh, back towards uh, 22.1 degrees. And this is a cooling event. So all the natural cycles uh, in the changing shape of Earth's orbit about the sun, the changing tilt of the rotation axis, they're all working to cool the planet. And normally it would cool the planet uh, by about 12 degrees uh, centigrade. The reason that didn't happen is thanks to the Younger Dryas cooling event, the asteroid that hit in Northwest Greenland, uh, there was a temporary period of extreme climate stability, which enabled humans to launch civilization, to expand their population, to be able to expand the region of human habitation and begin to engage in things like uh, converting forests into pasture land, uh, being able to breed cows. Uh, as you're probably well aware, cows are very efficient at uh, expelling greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. They sure burp a lot of carbon dioxide and methane uh, when they're digesting their food. Uh, same thing happens with sheep. And uh, when you cultivate rice and uh, uh, flood the rice fields, that also causes a big release of methane. Bottom line is human activity uh, was causing the planet to warm up at the same degree that the natural cycles were cooling the planet. And here's the amazing thing. For the past 9,500 years, we have human technological advance counterbalancing the natural cooling cycles. So instead of dropping rapidly into an ice age, we've had this period of climate stability uh, where the natural cooling cycles were slightly superseding uh, the human activity that was working to increasingly warm the planet. So for the past 9,500 years, the global mean temperature has declined by just one degree centigrade, not enough to really disturb uh, global civilization. The concern and the reason why you're seeing so many lectures and books and documentaries on climate change is from 1950 to 2020, the global mean temperature has gone up by one degree centigrade. Actually, you see that over the very extreme right of this graph that I show you here. And the concern is if it jumps up uh, by another degree or two centigrade, uh, that could melt the polar ice cap and bring on an ice age that we're not gonna be able uh, to stop. But the bottom line is, thanks to this 9,500 year period, where the global mean temperature hasn't changed by more than plus or minus 0 0.65 degrees, we've been able to build this amazing civilization, the technology and the wealth, where today we can sustain billions of human beings at one time. And if you actually look at Revelation uh, chapter uh, seven, uh, verse nine, you see this interesting statement where we see a vision being given to John. And he says, before me was a great multitude that no one could count for every nation, tribe, uh, people, and language. And at that time, the Greeks had a numbering system that would go up to a billion. So this is implying that the redeemed hosts before God in heaven would include billions of human beings, which means it was God's plan all along that we'd be able to develop the kind of wealth and technology where we could have billions of people alive on the planet at one time with the technology and the wealth so that billions of them can clearly hear the gospel message, respond to that gospel message and be redeemed from their sin and evil and be prepared for entry uh, for eternal life with God uh, in the new creation. In the time I got remaining, 
I want to focus just very briefly. You'll see a whole lot more in the book, Weathering Climate Change, but briefly on some of the things we can do uh, to stop the continued rise of the global mean temperature, sustain climate stability. I believe we can sustain it for at least another thousand years, maybe even 1500 years. Uh, and that would give us plenty of time uh, to actually take the good news of salvation to all the people groups of the world. Number one, uh, we can turn back the deserts. The Sahara Desert, here's a shot of the Sahara Desert. Uh, it's actually bigger than the continent of Australia. And it's 10 times the size it was as it was during the Roman Empire. And the reason why it's gotten so big, people living on the south edge of the Sahara Desert have been stripping it of vegetation and using that vegetation for cooking fuel. And at one time, the Sahara Desert, just a few decades ago, was moving south at a rate of six miles per year. It has slowed down since that time, but it's still a problem. But one of the proposals I make in weathering climate change, let's give the sub-Saharan people all the kerosene they want for free. So that on the condition, they stop stripping the land of vegetation. Give them all the cooking fuel they need. Also on the condition, they work with the rest of us to replant the Sahara Desert. If we were to shrink the Sahara Desert down to what it was during the Roman Empire era, we would now have it was now the Sahara Desert uh, be transformed uh, into wheat and cornfields. This would provide a food supply for the world, an income supply for the people living in Africa, and would soak up huge quantities of greenhouse gases. It's a perfect example of a win-win-win uh, solution, and would also benefit the life that exists there and what is now uh, the Sahara Desert. So this is what it looks like now, and literally we can shrink it down to just one-tenth that size. We can do the same thing with the Gobi Desert. Uh, it's four times bigger than what it was 2,000 years ago, and that can be done to other deserts. How quickly can it be done? The Israelis have also already shown us it can be done in as little as one generation, uh, 20 to 30 years. But you've all probably heard about um, the concern over the Amazon jungle, how people who live in the Amazon are uh, just cutting down the trees, just burning it, not even selling the lumber, just burning it and converting it into pasture land. <laughs> and the reason they're doing this is they think that they can make more money by raising cattle on pasture land than they can from managing the forest and using its lumber products as a means to sustain income. Consequently, what we've seen is that the Amazon has five and a half million square kilometers over half the Earth's rainforest. However, if we keep uh, converting the jungle into uh, pasture land, there reaches a point where there's not enough trees there uh, to sustain the rainfall that's necessary. And the irony is, if we keep this up, we're gonna transform what is now the Amazon jungle, one of the wettest places on earth, into a dry uh, desert. And this just shows you the rate at which deforestation is taking place. This is just the Brazilian Amazon forest. In 1970, it covered 4,100,000 square kilometers. Today, it's under 3,300,000. 20% of it has been lost. And what we can do is basically go uh, to the Amazonian peoples and say, you know what, instead of trying to convert this to pasture land and make money <coughs> on ranching, the soil we know is only suitable for ranching for about a decade. And when that happens, you're not gonna make any money at all. Uh, you won't be able to sustain cattle. You're basically gonna be dealing with the desert. Far better is instead of trying to make money off of ranching, make money off of lumbering. And one of the things that researchers in the Amazon have discovered is that the younger trees can grow up to four times faster than the old trees. And if you leave the old trees alone, they die. And when they die, as you see here, uh, they decay. And when they decay, they release greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. We'd be far better off uh, harvesting these old trees. These old trees are big. 
And that's where you get your most valuable lumber is from harvesting these big old trees. And these big old trees are growing at a much slower rate than the younger trees. So they're not pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere as efficiently the younger trees. So research now shows us that the best way to manage the Amazon on all forests, for that matter, the forests we have here in North America and around the world, is to selectively harvest the old trees before they're at the point of dying and decaying, selling that lumber uh, where that carbon is gonna be sequestered as furniture and houses for centuries, and then replant uh, with the younger trees that are growing grow much faster and pull up many more uh, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. This is gonna be good for the wildlife in the forest. What we notice here, for example, you got so much dead wood, it actually creates a barrier for the wildlife there. Far better to clear a lot of that out and uh, enable the wildlife to thrive there. Uh, you make more money on the lumbering and uh, it's sustainable and uh, everybody wins. That's an example of a win-win uh, solution. And what I've done in weathering climate change is to provide examples of many more, for example, of how we could actually go to thorium nuclear reactors instead of uranium nuclear reactors. And uh, we now have research that shows uh, with uranium, you get energy at a much cheaper rate. That is cheaper than any form of energy we get today. And uh, the nuclear waste problem is just a tiny, tiny fraction of what you got with uranium and it's much cheaper and there's a much more abundant supply. You can read about this uh, in, in the probable uh, planet. Uh, and uh, again, you can get a free chapter there about weathering climate change. I wanna thank you uh, for this and we'll take time for questions. Wow, thank you, Dr. Ross. Let's give him a hand just for joining us again this morning. And again, I, I want to encourage us just to remember that each service is unique, and the Q&A will also be there. Last night, we had a, a great time interacting with Dr. Ross, and he, in the Q&A time, he even shared his own personal journey as a scientist at a young age, seeking to really find truth and almost, you know, I, I don't know if you were on the quest to disprove Christianity, but it was, it, it, science led you to Christianity, and the Bible confirmed uh, science to you, not the other way around. And I would love for almost every one of our services to hear this again. You don't have to elaborate as much as you'd want to, but just a little bit again on as a scientist that you've given your life to studying science in all different forms, how you see the Bible proves science and the two are compatible compared to contradicting each other. Just give us a few minutes on that to start off and then we'll get into some more questions. Well, my parents say that I was a born scientist. I mean, from the time of uh, age seven onwards, I was reading several books on physics and astronomy a week. Uh, so, but by the time I was 16, I realized that the universe had a beginning. And if it's got a beginning, there must be a beginner. So even though I was not raised in a Christian home, uh, even though uh, I didn't know any Christians, starting at age 17, I began a quest to find this God behind the universe. Looked for him first in the writings of the great philosophers, then I dived into the holy books of the world's religions, and finally I picked up a Bible that had been given to me by the Gideons in my uh, public school, and after studying that Gideon Bible uh, for about 18 months, I finally realized this book indeed uh, is the error-free communication from the one that created the universe, I was impressed how it actually forecasts hundreds of times future scientific discoveries. And so as at age 19, I signed my name in the back of a Gideon Bible, committing my life to Jesus Christ, and then began to look for opportunities to share my faith uh, with my fellow students and professors. Praise God for that Gideon Bible. Amen. Well, we got Phil with us this morning, one of our pastors here, but also biochemist for the majority of your life, turned pastor in the last several years. And we have several questions coming in from online and then, of course, here. So, Phil, let's just jump right in and we'll go from there. Sounds good. You made it sound as if, you know, I led a, a derelict, derelict life. There was a biochemist and then found, <laughs> the Lord found me. Um, seriously, Hugh, I, I just really appreciate your your willingness to share 
And even though I'm trained as a scientist, pretty quickly I start wondering, you know, about the time you were reading physics books, I was reading cartoon books and comic books. So a lot of us sometimes struggle with the terminology and, and, and what you're sharing there. One of the first questions that came in is a number of times you use the phrase compelling evidence for some research, but not for others. Can you help the lay people, including me, um, what makes some of the data compelling to an astrophysicist that, that allows you to make some conclusions and, and take it forward? That's a great question, and it actually led to an, a fairly long article I wrote. You'll find it at reasons.org, how to evaluate scientific discoveries. And basically, I make the point in that paper is that there are statistical errors that are generated by the incapacity of the instruments to make accurate measurements, but there's also what we call systematic errors, uh, which are effects that will tilt all the measurements up or down in value. And basically, I made the uh, point in that article, uh, take with a huge grain of salt any scientific discovery where they don't publish both the statistical errors and the uh, systematic errors and actually identify what those systematics are and hopefully be honest enough to say this is where we may have unknown systematics. It gives you some idea how much trust to put in the actual discovery uh, and the measurement. And then you want to see what other scientists are saying. And that's the wonder of living in the 21st century. You can go to sites like PubMed uh, or the NASA Harvard site and they'll archive for you all the papers published in the physical sciences for the NASA site and all the papers published in the life sciences on the PubMed site. And you can quickly get an idea what the scientific consensus is because scientists are very aggressive at, at criticizing one another and by reading those critiques, it gives you an idea. And they say, I'm not a scientist. I can't dig into all that stuff. Well, every science research paper comes with an abstract, a paragraph long bottom line that almost always is accessible to the lay public. And, uh, so, and those are always available free of charge uh, in every research paper. So you can go to that uh, article on our reasons.org website, and I think it'll guide you. Basically, I'm telling people, don't trust anything you read on the web if they don't give you a link to the peer-reviewed scientific research paper. Very, very similar to other aspects of science. That's, that's encouraging. Did you have something? Yeah, and you gotta t I would like for you to answer this in a, in a way that, you know, you know, think of me, you know, as simple-minded as possible. You've done this for me before, and I so appreciated it. But you throw out some of these, these years, like, for instance, the asteroid that hit and I don't know if it was the one in the South China Sea or the other one, but, you know, so far ago, I think there was one you said 2.5 million years ago. So how do you come to that number? How, did, how can we even measure that that's when it hit in that specific part of the Earth? Well, they were able to dredge, uh, you know, uh, minerals uh, at the bottom of the ocean floor, and uh, those minerals had the isotope signatures uh, of a metal asteroid that it struck. And so, uh, and they're, they're, they were able to use uh, different radioisotopes uh, that were in those same minerals uh, to come up with a date. And in that case, they came up with an accurate date 2.58 million years ago. And that matches the time uh, when our ice age cycle was launched. And uh, that was able to be dated uh, by looking at uh, deep ice age cores and sediment cores off of New Zealand and in Antarctica. So if somebody believes that in, in a young Earth, that the Earth's not that old, how, what do they do with that information? How would a young Earth scientist uh, respond to that? Well, they would respond by saying that uh, God had uh, changed uh, the laws of physics when Adam sinned or at the flood of Noah. Uh, and in most cases, uh, they would say that that happened twice both at Noah's flood uh, and at the time of uh, uh, Adam's sin. And therefore, you would have these radiometric decay rates uh, taking place much more rapidly uh, than they do now. The problem with that uh, point of view is the Bible repeatedly tells us that the laws of physics are immutable. They do not change. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they've been fixed since the time that God created the universe. That God says in Jeremiah 33, I'm not like you. You change your mind all the time. I'm a God that does not change. As proof, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And in astronomy, we can look at distant stars and galaxies, and we can measure the laws of physics at the time that that light left those stars and galaxies. And that tells us there's been zero change in any of the laws of physics over the past 12 billion years, wow. uh, and in some cases to 16 and 18 places of the decimal. In fact, that was one of the things that persuaded me the Bible got everything right, is it says the laws of physics don't change, we astronomers have measurements to prove that the Bible actually got it right on that point. Wow. One of the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we were cleaning out a shed the other day and I'm benefiting from <clears throat> losing my voice a bit here. Is there a common understanding agreement on the comet or slash asteroid collisions? And if so, why don't we hear more about this? This seems to make so much sense. Well, there's been a, a controversy or a debate in the scientific community because when we look at these uh, mass extinction events, we see not only evidence uh, for a giant comet or asteroid uh, colliding with the Earth, we also see evidence uh, for massive supervolcanic eruptions. But what's happened recently is that they've been able to date very accurately the moment when these supervolcanic eruptions began, and it's identical to the accurate time we have, for example, uh, when the asteroid struck in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, in Mexico. And that led to geophysicists developing models saying, if you get an asteroid that big struck, striking in the Yucatan Peninsula, it will actually puncture uh, the Earth's crust, disturb it sufficiently, that is going to ignite supervolcanic eruptions around the world. And so it's not either or, it's both and, uh, but the volcanic eruptions are actually ignited uh, by these giant comet and asteroid collisions. Incidentally, there is a controversy published just two weeks ago about the asteroid that struck in northwest Greenland, because they said, we don't think that's what caused the cooling. Look at all these volcanic eruptions. Uh, but the truth is, that was a big enough asteroid that it would have ignited volcanic eruptions. Moreover, that was a time when thousands of feet of ice were melting off the North American continent, and the melting of that ice causes the North American continental plate to rebound, to bounce back up, and when that happens, that ignites volcanic eruptions. As it relates to, you know, some of these objects striking Earth in such a <laughs> massive way, why, why, does that not, why is that not happening now? Why was that in a certain amount of time then? But we haven't seen that, of course, in, I guess, a long time as far as that proportion. Well, what I wrote about in Weathering Climate Change, to get three big asteroids striking the Earth in just a two and a half million year window, indeed, is extremely rare. Uh, we expect to get an asteroid of that size uh, striking the Earth once every 10 to 15 million years, and we had three striking within a two and a half million year period. So I actually cite that as evidence that this is God controlling the physics of our solar system in order to make sure we get just the right asteroids hitting the Earth of just the right size in just the right location at just the right uh, time uh, in order to bring about this period of extreme climate stability. Uh, I talk about God being the ultimate dart thrower. Uh, is that he is able to hit a bullseye at just the right time in order to get the result that he wants? Last night, <clears throat> we talked about that and just the, what that reveals in the Father heart of God. That reveals this God of love that has great desire for relationship with humanity. So he creates this unique time frame so that that can be a reality. That's pretty special. Go ahead, Phil. Um, I, I think someone read on one of your chats on the R, your RTB teaching, there was a comment made by someone stating that Satan will not be locked up for a literal thousand years because of global warming, and they quote 2 Peter 3.8. 
um, your position, Dr. Ross, is that you consistently show that science provides support for the Bible. Um, what about those in our, in our culture, in our society, that seem to challenge the truth or interpretation of Scripture with every scientific finding that comes down the road? I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, please. Well, we actually encourage that at Reasons to Believe. I mean, we have the repeated in the Bible, we need to put everything to the test. The key, though, is not to be a cynic. Uh, you're to put everything to the test, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, hold fast to that which is good. So after testing it and finding that it's true, we need to embrace that truth and live by that truth. And so God loves skeptics, but he's not too pleased with the cynics where they find out that something is true and they say, well, that's not gonna make any difference in my life. It should have an impact on your life. And the thing I've observed too, is every time a scientific challenge comes up to my Christian faith, it's an opportunity for me to research that in more depth. And every time I've seen that it gets resolved, but when it gets resolved, it reveals three or more things that looks like it might uh, challenge my faith but they're at a lower level of significance. That tells me I'm on the pathway to truth. I mean, we'll never know everything, but as we begin to resolve the big issues, we discover it opens up smaller issues that are less significant. And frankly, that's a great way to learn. Every time something comes up to challenge, let's dig into it, see what happens. But over my whole life, it's always gone in favor of the Bible and the Christian faith. Thank you. So lots of questions coming in on the ice ages and then humans enduring those ice ages. So the question is, how long have humans lived on the earth? And, and of course, I'm guessing you believe that Adam and Eve were the first humans. Yes. When was that? And talk a little bit more about that, humans enduring ice ages, and then what's your approximate years as far as when humanity actually started? Well, in Genesis chapter 2, it tells us that God created Adam and Eve, put them in a garden, and in that garden, four known rivers came together. The Tigris and Euphrates are still flowing to this day. The Gihon and the Pishon are now dry riverbeds. But during the last ice age, all four rivers were flowing. Moreover, they only come together in a single location in a place that is now 200 feet below sea level basically in the southeastern part of the Persian Gulf. That tells us that God created Adam and Eve during the last ice age, because during the last ice age, sea levels were about three to 400 feet lower than they are today, uh, which means we had humans living during the last ice age. That means we had humans living at a time of extreme climate instability. And this explains why we're not finding evidence uh, for global civilization basically because of the extreme climate instability, uh, humans uh, were limited to a relatively small part of the world. In fact, we see that in the Bible. Humans don't become globally distributed until after Noah's flood. That would be consistent with what we understand about the ice age. Uh, and we do now have evidence that humans living during the last ice age were actually engaged in sophisticated technology they were actually had farms, uh, they were planting different grains, they were harvesting those grains, uh, roasting those grains and grinding them and making bakery products. We can trace that as far back as 36,000 years that was going on, but it was all on a very small scale and very localized because of the extreme climate instability. It's not until the climate stabilized that people were able to count on the fact if I plant several acres of wheat, I'm going to get a good harvest. They could count on the climate to do that. That's when humans began to specialize. That's when they began to scale up. And that's when it was possible for just a few percent of the human population to grow enough food for everybody, which set most of us free to do engineering, science, music, art, literature. And that explains the Neolithic revolution a burst of civilization that took place at the end of the last ice age. So if you were to put a, a year on it, how many years do you think ago were Adam and Eve created? 
Well, all we can get from Genesis chapter 2 is that God created them sometime during the last ice age. I think he probably created them at a time when there were, where there was easy migration routes between the Persian Gulf and East Africa. There was a land bridge that joined uh, Arabia to East Africa at that time. And there are three epochs uh, when that was in place, because we do have evidence of the earliest human artifacts in both East Africa and the Persian Gulf. And so the three epochs are 117,000 years ago, about 74,000 years ago, and about 56,000 years ago. I think one of those three is most likely, but frankly, based on Genesis chapter two, any time between 15,000 years ago and 130,000 years ago would work. And believe wow. it or not, that's a more accurate date than we get from the science. Uh, once you get beyond the limits of carbon-14 dating, we don't have uh, any direct method uh, for dating the artifacts left behind by humans or their bones. So when you read the scientific literature, the scientific date for the origin of human beings is 150,000 years ago, plus or minus 150,000 years. <laughs> we actually get a better date from the Bible. Wow, that's super helpful, thank you. <clears throat> One of the other questions in, in this same section was, what are some practical ways to engage in conversation regarding climate change with a non-believer in a redeeming way? So it's, it's not so much about data, it's about persuasiveness. Well, I wrote the book Weathering Climate Change because this is a hot topic and it's easy to engage people on that subject. Everybody wants to talk about it. But what I'm trying to stress, and hopefully people got that in this morning's message, is that when you bring the biblical principles in, into bear, suddenly we can resolve uh, the, the debate and the politics that are involved here. I mean, one of those biblical principles is that we human beings are fundamentally selfish. Therefore, trying to stabilize climate uh, by reducing uh, the uh, you know, standard of living of people around the world, which is what most books on climate change are saying we have to do, you know, eliminate uh, transportation and factories, et cetera. But that's going to hurt the economy. And people are fundamentally selfish. They're not going to do it. The second biblical principle I think is important is that God has given a command to Adam and Eve and in principle to all of us human beings. And you see it also in the book of Job were to manage the resources of planet Earth for our benefit and the benefit of all the rest of Earth's life. That means we'll not be, be between a rock and a hard place where we have to choose between what's beneficial for us and what's beneficial uh, for the ecosystem. God in advance has provided us with solutions that are gonna be for our benefit and the benefit of all life. We just need to look at the record of nature and find those solutions. And in my book, I give you 40 different examples of how we can have our cake and eat it too. Uh, benefit the world, stabilize the climate, benefit all the rest of life on planet Earth, and actually increase the economy of the world, and especially for the benefit of the poor. Everybody wins, and if everybody wins, you take the politics out of the debate. Thank you. We have a, a family debate going here between some parents and their kids, and it's about Adam and Eve and dinosaurs on the earth at the same time or not. It says the adults are saying they're not at the same time. The kids are saying, yes, we need you to, to break in here and, and set the record straight for us. Well, this is a debate that happens uh, with people who think that the Bible teaches that the earth is only thousands of years old. And that's where it's important to actually take your children, not just through Genesis 1, but all the creation texts in the Bible. There's more than two dozen of them. I think it's important to teach your children. The Bible is a collection of 66 separate books. And before you draw a conclusion on what the Bible is saying, you need to integrate what all those books are saying. So look at all the creation texts but interpret them literally and consistently. And I'm persuaded when you do that, it becomes quite clear that the creation days in Genesis chapter one are six consecutive long periods of time. And also what I think works for children, because they will hear in school uh, that 
you know, we don't see any evidence of God's supernatural interventions in uh, science. Well, that's because we're in the seventh day. Uh, when God created Eve, he stopped his creation activity. Uh, he went into a state of resting from his work of creation. So all we see in the human era are the natural processes. But if you look at astronomy and geophysics and geology and paleontology, this is where you're examining what was going on before human beings existed. And this is where you see the scientific evidence everywhere for God's supernatural interventions. And what you see in Psalm 104 is that God has packed the earth with as much life as possible and as diverse as possible for as long as possible. Wow. And so, for example, when you've got a situation on earth where you've got these huge shallow seas all over the continents, that's a perfect time for God to create giant animals because now you've got the water uh, to provide the buoyancy that makes possible dinosaurs that weigh 80 tons. Without water, the biggest animal you can have is an elephant. Any animal bigger than an elephant will injure itself just to the effects of the law of gravity. But if you've got shallow seas providing buoyancy, you can have creatures that are much larger. And it's God's intent, no matter what the geology of the earth, he's going to pack it with as much life as possible. And because of all that life that has existed on the earth, we human beings today have the a benefit of more than 76 quadrillion tons of the remains of previous generations of life. Limestone, marble, uh, gypsum, coal, oil, natural gas. That's all there in the crust of the earth, thanks to millions of generations of life that has preceded us, including the dinosaurs. I remember seeing a cartoon in a magazine, and it showed this dinosaur on a psychiatrist's couch. And he says to his uh, dinosaur psychiatrist, I keep having these repeating nightmares and they're highly symbolic. Can you tell me why I keep having these nightmares? And the psychiatrist says, well, tell me, what are the symbols you keep seeing? And he says, WD-40. <laughs> so, you, so what do you think then as far as, was Adam and Eve then, were they, was human interacting with dinosaurs? What do you think? Or, no. or, or at least on the planet at the same time? Well, in order to get the biodeposits we need to be able to have global high technology civilization so that billions of human beings can hear the gospel message and respond and receive Christ as creator, Lord and savior. First of all, you need 3 billion years of microbial activity on the planet. Wow. Those microbes transform the metals on the earth uh, into uh, insoluble form where they're no longer a danger uh, to advanced life. And then you need to have uh, half billion years of plants and animals to build up the fossil fuels that we need to sustain our civilization and all the limestone that we're gonna need uh, to make freeways and skyscrapers. And so the dinosaurs uh, fall into that category of providing us with the biodeposits we need. Uh, the last dinosaur went extinct 66 million years ago. Okay, so, uh, so there you go. So yeah, they're, they're long gone. So I think we, the parents win the debate on this one. <laughs> go ahead, Phil, one more, and then we're going to go. Okay, this is just the short one, and it refers to earlier comments that you just touched on. Uh, shortages of sand for industrial uses. Is it too trivial to wonder why... People don't sell sand from the Sahara Desert to whoever wants it, needs it for a building, or is that cost prohibitive? Well, it's much easier to take sand off of a beach and put it on a boat and ship it to these uh, nations that are short of sand. So uh, that's kind of where they're trying to get it. Yes, you could get it from the Sahara Desert, uh, but yeah, it's much more expensive because now you've got to truck it to a ship. Thanks. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Let's give him a hand this morning just for interacting with us. You're going to be doing a, a, another unique service here a minute or so on what you're doing. I know it's going to be a good one at the 11 a.m. Tell us just a little bit about it. 
Well, uh, I'm going to be speaking on the physics of suffering and what the Bible says about suffering and uh, how that fits into the present creation and preparing us for the new creation. I mean, it's kind of like going to college. Uh, you go to college, you take a course, uh, you suffer during that course, but it prepares you for a very wonderful career. And so I'll be speaking uh, about yeah. the physics of suffering and uh, how we can actually experience great joy. I mean, just as students really love their courses, I think we can really love the course that God's taking us through. Praise God. Okay, Dr. Ross, we'll see you in just a little bit. God bless you. A couple of things here before we come to an end. Uh, number one is we uh, had communion this week, the first Wednesday of every month. We come together and have communion, and then we follow that the weekend after. So if you weren't able to participate when we dismiss, right over in the atrium chapel, we usually do it in here, We'll be doing it in the atrium chapel. We'll be having communion uh, just following this. And then two things about Dr. Ross and Reasons to Believe. We have a local chapter that meets right here in the St. Louis area. They actually, some meet right here on the Grace Church campus. Uh, lots of guys interacting with Dr. Ross and his team. Uh, how we can just continue this conversation if that intrigues you. Their team is going to be right back in the back just outside the auditorium check in on that. And then resources. They have been really gracious to us because usually when he would come and visit in person, have a whole plethora of books, but of course they're not here in person. However, Grace Church 2020, look at this code. Grace Church 2020 is a code, 40% off on all of their resources, all of the books that he just talked about and many, many other books that are on their website. You can see the details here online as well. That code's going to be good, he said, for about a month. So take advantage of that. That's a great discount on some incredible uh, resources. And I believe that's it. So God bless you. Again, tune in with us if you can at the 11 a.m., all new content. God bless you.